right, uh, so we see 0 is plugging for x. Why not? We get 0.5y equals 6. Divide both sides by 0.5 and come out with 3. So is that right? No, what should it be? 12. 12. 6 divided by a half should be 12. So what happened there? Half six. What's that? Took half of six. Took half of six. Yeah. So 0.5 is a half. You see half, you see six. Uh, so maybe that's what happened. Maybe she took half of six. Just got a little confused. You see it on your tests all the time. Okay. Just getting a little bit mixed up when you're using whatever. So uh, took half of six, which isn't what we were looking for. We were looking for six divided by one half, which is the same as six times two. Um, so she got three. How could Sheridan have checked to see if three was correct? Yeah. Okay, plug it in, plug in three. Is that all we need? Why is three? And then, and then plug in x is zero. That's what we did. We plugged in zero for x in the first place. Fat y was three. So zero and three should work for x and y. And they won't work. We need to have a 12 there for y if we want to wind up with 6. Okay? So plug in x equals 0, y equals 3, and see if it comes out to be equal to 6. Here we have Emerson doing good work. Uh, found the x and y coordinates or x y intercepts uh, correctly. And here's his work. Y, and I want you to. Write this down in words, express it uh, in, on paper. Uh, why does Emerson plug a zero in for y? So uh, give me an answer to that. All right, so why? Why did she or he, why did Emerson plug in zero for y? Derek? He gets so many x bytes, so he gets x bytes. So he has one variable. Okay, so he plugs in zero because uh, his teacher told him to, no, because he remembered to, no. It's because it's, he wants to get x by itself, and what easier way than to get rid of one of the variables completely by making it zero, right? So it makes it easy, easy to solve. Why does Emerson plug zero in for x? Find y. Huh? Because it makes it easier to find y. It makes it easier to find y. It makes it easy to find y. It plugs in uh, a zero for y, finds out x would have to be one fourth, so it gets point one fourth, one fourth comma zero. It plugs in zero for x, find out y that has to be equal to negative two. To get the point zero, negative two. So there's that point right there. Point one fourth comma zero. Right there. All you need are two points. You graph the line. It has two points. He knows it should be a line, so you connect those two points and make a line. What is this point called? It's got a special name. Origin. Row. Oh, sorry, yeah, it's really close. That's the origin. What's this point right here? 0.25. Okay. It's name. X what? The X intercept. Oh, yeah. And this one? Y intercept. Y intercept. Special names where the line intercepts the X or the Y axis to direct to Y. Is that how you label them? Like, it's uh, to label them, you would not not this, but this one fourth zero. Okay, is the label the dot is x It's what? It's x intercept is the little dot. Is the little dot? Yeah. Yes, it's this little. It was blue. Now it kind of covered up the screen. It was a blue dot. <coughs> I'm more interested in knowing where the dot is or the point is rather than what it's called. I want to know where it is. Uh, before we pass our homework in, are there any questions for the last moment? No, no, no. Sorry. Uh, no.
was the last question. Uh, a word problem? Yeah. Rectangular park, so as soon as you start hearing shapes, it's helpful to draw those shapes. Rectangular park, 72 feet. Uh, let x be the park's width and y be the length. Okay. Um, so you call this the width, and we can call this the length. Uh, what's the perimeter of a rectangle? What's the definition of a perimeter of a rectangle? Length times width? No. What's length times width? Wrong. Just go. What's length width? Okay. That's the area is length times width. Uh, uh, like all the, uh, yeah. Wow, I didn't know. Variables. The sides. Add all the sides together. The side is a measure of length. If we add up all the sides, then we'll have the perimeter. So how do we write the equation Ooh. involving the perimeter? Yeah. 72 equals 2 and where x what? The length, so two times x. Two times the length x. Plus two times y. Two times the length y. Wrote an equation in the perimeter. We did it. That's part A. Um, find the intercepts of the graph of the equation you wrote. Then graph the equation. So we want to find the intercepts. We want to find the y-intercept, where it crosses the y-axis and the x-intercept. How do we find the y-intercept? Zero in for x. Why is zero? Why do we put zero in for x to find the y-intercept? And you find out what y is. If x is zero, then you must be on the y-axis if you're on a graph. And if you're on a graph and your x is zero, then you must be on the y-axis somewhere. Okay, so we put it at zero for x. Mm -hmm. Find 2y equals 72 divided by 2, and we get 36. Yeah. So that's the y-intercept, 36. 36 mark. And find the x-intercept, we do the same thing with y. We plug in 0 for y, so 2x equals 72, so x equals 36 as well. Those are the intercepts of the graph. <coughs> what would this park look like if its length was 36? This park, this is a rectangular park. Rectangular park. What would it look what would this park look like if its length was 36? It'd be what? Both sides of 36. If this side were 36 and this side were 36. Well, they're always going to be the same. That's the way we're going to work. If this side is 36 and this side is 36, and we know that all the sides added together are 72. Oh, yes, but 36. Why would you have to do that? There's a two times two times something is thirty-six. Nope. What? X is thirty-six. Not two times something is thirty-six. X, the number X, is thirty-six. So what would it look like if X was thirty-six or if Y was thirty-six? What would this part look like? Square. <coughs> so a square that would mean that if these two sides were thirty-six. If you're saying it's a square, then that means these sides would be 36. Is that right? How can we see if it's right or not? What do we know about the park? A rectangle. Yes, it's a rectangle. What else do we know about the park? 72 feet. What about 72 feet? That's the perimeter. Okay. Is the perimeter of this square 30 or uh, is this 72? No. What is it? What's the perimeter of this park? 140 
four. That's too much. Four of eight. So that's not true. It's not a square. Yeah. Okay. So let's go back. Back to square one. Back to the drawing board. If this side were 36 and this side were 36, what would this part look like? Could be what? What would be zero? X. X would be zero. So what would this part look like? It would just be like this. I don't know. It'd be rectangle. It'd be rectangle with one of the sides is zero. The part would be really skinny. It would be very skinny. So skinny that you couldn't see it. <coughs> yeah, it would be like one little grass thing. Maybe, yeah, a long line of grass, blades of grass. Yeah. Right? Just pushing up in between two pieces of concrete because this part has perimeter 72 and length 36, leaving nothing for the width. So 36 is not realistic, and 36 for the other side is not realistic. Somewhere in between, some, some uh, what is this, width and length that is more realistic is, is what this park actually probably looks like. Okay. Any other questions from the homework? It says identify the x-intercept and the y-intercept of the graph. Where do we find an x-intercept on a graph? On the x-axis. So we look on the x-axis. There's where the graph crosses the x-axis. That's our x-intercept. Where is that? Two. Two. Two comes zero. How about the y-intercept? That's where it crosses the y-axis. Where is that? One. Zero comma one. in y-intercept form, you, or a slope-intercept form, you may not. We're going to discover why it's called that and the easiest way to use this form of an equation. Okay. Um, in the previous section, we were dealing mainly with standard form where we had ax plus by equals c, and it was really easy to plug in zero for one of those. It goes away and we solve the equation that's left. Okay. So let's use that same kind of an idea here. Um, let me plug in a number for, um, well, first let's note this. Take notice that y is already by itself. Mm -hmm. So we don't, like, it's already solved for. So if we wanted to find a value for y, Put how could we quickly find a value for y? Put it in, I mean, that goes from, I was going from a to b, and Derek went from a to c. 
which is fine, which is good. Right? The, uh, the thing that we could do easily is plug a value in for x. The easiest one I could think of would be 0. Plugging 0 in for x would it completely eliminate that x term. And you know, it's going to be really easy to solve, you can see. y equals 3 times 0 plus 4. y is 4. So that gives us what point does that give us? 0 for 0 for x or for y. Remember, as we're trying to graph a line, what's the, what is the least amount of work that we need to do? What's the least amount of information we need? Is that Lily? Two. Two what? Uh, two, points. two points. We need two things, two points. We only need two places to draw through to get our line. Well, plugging in zero for x was very, very simple. So that made finding a zero come before really easy. Is there another number that would be really easy to plug in? One. Plug in one for x. Okay, three times zero is probably the easiest multiplication problem you can think of. So three times zero is, is optimal. Three times one is also very easy. Even three times one is itself. So y equals three plus four y equals seven. One comma seven. Now we have enough information to draw our lines. For now, if, we're, if we'd like to uh, create a pattern that's useful to us, maybe we should not stop there. Um, if we went over to x is 2, we just move over 1. Over to x is 2. And we want to find that point on the line. That would probably be the next easiest point to find, as opposed to going to x is 1.25 or 1.5 or something like that in between 1 and 2. Just go right to 2, and you have to do this simple calculation of 3 times 2 plus 4. So notice here we have 4 plus nothing. 4 plus 3. 4 plus 6, so y equals 10. So we had 0 comma 4, move over 1, we're at 1 comma 7, move over 1 to 2, 2 comma 10. <coughs> Let's say we didn't plug any numbers in next, we just kind of made a guess, maybe there's a pattern coming out of this. Move over to 3, what y value do you think we'd get? Y13. The y values are going up by 3. Plus 3, you get 7. Plus 3, you get 10. Plus 3, you get 13. Well, that's, pretty, that's pretty nice, I think. It seems like something we might be able to do this. So, why do you plug in 0 for x? Y by I can think of an easier way to get y by itself than to just eliminate the x term by plugging in 0 and you're just left with this guy here. Okay. And then why 1 after that? Why would we put 1 in for x? Easy. It's the easiest number I can think of to plug in for x. 3 times 1, very easy math problem, right? Okay. And we notice we get this uh, as we move over 1, we move up 3. Okay. So let's just do another one and see what we notice. Easiest point we can find. Is that a raising of the hand? Yes. Nathan? Yeah. Zero, I mean, X zero and Y two. X is zero. Well, we don't even have to write this down, do we? Put a zero in for X? 
No, it's it's <coughs> obviously going to be zero right here. We put zero for x, so we just get two. So here's one thing about the slope-intercept form, um, which another way to say slope-intercept form is what? Well, do mx plus b, so let's be a little more creative than just reading it out of the book. We have more resources, so just think. M. M. Where did you hear M from? Just reading it out of the book, right? M is a slope. Yes, very good. You read the book that says M is the slope. Yeah. Okay. Maybe let's work off of this group work. We have a resource available beyond just the book. Mm -hmm. okay. You just had a book, I would say, read your books. If you don't have them, that's all you have. But here we have more. We can reveal it in layers. Yeah. Okay. So another way to slope, say slope-intercept form, what we've noticed about at least the last two of them is that y is by itself. Mm -hmm. Y by itself, and then you got something times x plus something else. Okay. Um, so one thing that we notice is if we plug in z, zero for x, the x term goes away and all that's left is the constant that was next to it. Right? And it gives us the point zero, two. And whatever that number is, if we put in zero for x, it'll be zero that number, zero that number, whatever that is. Right? And what is the name of this point? It's got a special name. Intercept. 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 Okay. Like I said, this form is called the slope-intercept form. There's your intercept part of it. Why it's called slope-intercept is because this guy right here is your y-intercept. You can see that if you plug in 0 for x, you'll get the y-intercept real quickly by just looking at the color. <coughs> so we've got that point 0, 2. Okay. And what maybe is the next easiest one? Again, one. Always do. Multiply by one. Very easy to multiply by one. So y equals negative three times one plus two. So y is negative one. Two minus three. One negative. We got two points. Connect those two points. We got a line. Let's use our experience from this previous problem where we, we saw that pattern arise moving it over and up. If this is 0, 2, and this is 1, negative 1, if we moved over to 2, where do you think that would be? 2, comma, negative 4, y negative 4? Going down 3. And if we went over to Three. What do you think it would be? Three comma negative seven. Mm -hmm. How did you find one negative one? So we just plugged in. One is x, right? Yeah. One is x. Why one? Because one's so easy to put in for x. Mm -hmm. So we put a one in for x. One times negative three is negative three. Negative three plus two is negative one. Oh, okay. So there's our x is one, and y came out to be negative. looks like it's, it's, it would make sense. If it's a line that if you move over some, you move down the same amount. You move over, down three, over one, down three, down three. Definitely noteworthy. But I want to do one more before we you know, call it the slope. So easy. Put in zero and put in one. One is easy. Two, not too bad. Three. Put in zero, put in one, those two, very easy. Zero is the easiest, then we move on to uh, another convenient number. Um, number seven, y equals two thirds x minus one. Okay. Now that we have some experience, well, there's this, this first number that's really easy to plug in, which would be zero. zero. Super easy. Put zero in for x. We don't even have to do anything. <coughs> it's all mental. Two thirds times zero, it's just zero. So we wind up with the point zero comma negative one. Okay, it goes right there. Every time you can just do zero comma, 
that number. If you plug in zero for x, it'll go away. All that's left is the constant. Now, without shouting it out, without giving it away to anybody, I want you to just think for a minute or so. Okay. In the previous problems, we've just gone on to plug in after zero, we plug in one for x. Not too bad, not, not very difficult. Now, we plug in zero already. Now, what should be the next number? Don't shout it out, don't give it away. Think about it. What would be the next most easy number to plug in for x? Think about it. Maybe write it down, maybe try it out. Okay, just take a little bit of time to think about it. All right, now we've thought about it for a minute. And let me just point out you know, why I'm asking this question. Here's something we could do. And we could do the same thing that we've done on the other problems, and we could just say, we plugged in zero for x. Let's move on to the typical one. Okay, but here's what happens. We get 2 thirds times 1 is 2 thirds minus 1. And so now our y value, we're going to mess with these fractions. Right? And so maybe, and it's not wrong, we, that just gives us the point 1 comma uh, negative 1 third. Okay. I know not everybody likes fractions as much as I do, I think it's fine. But uh, one thing that is difficult about fractions is graphing them because we don't normally mark off our paper in one third scale. Right? We mark it off one, two, three, four. So it would be nice if we didn't have this fraction, we have to kind of guesstimate <coughs> where it is. Okay. So what's a value of x that might make the whole thing a little easier? Yeah. Uh, Put in the reciprocal right. of two thirds. Okay, so that would be. Uh, I like that idea. Okay, why? Three equals two thirds times three halves. Then we just get one. one minus one, and in this case, y is zero. Okay. Of course, that won't always happen unless you subtract or subtract one. Okay, so what point does that give us? <coughs> What's that? One. One zero. This number right here. Well, wouldn't it be a one because they're interchangeable? No, mm -hmm. the number that you put right here is the number you put in for x. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. 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 So it would be three halves. We put in three halves, the reciprocal of two thirds, and got zero. Now I like that idea because it made this part not really a fraction and have to worry about that. But then. The thing that you plug in for x is also a fraction, which is, like I said, it's difficult to graph. It's not impossible. There's one half, two halves, three halves, uh, three halves comma zero. We could put a point right there. It's correct. It will be on the line. But was there anybody find a number you plug in for x? Or maybe the number you plug in for x is not a fraction, and the number you get out is not a fraction. Okay. I don't know if I did it right, but I got I did negative one. You plugged negative one in, okay. Plugged in negative one for x. I could be wrong. Why? Well, we can plug anything we want in for x. Anything we want, okay. Negative one. This one. This is two thirds times negative one. It's negative two thirds minus one. That's negative five thirds. Yeah. <coughs> negative one, negative five thirds. It's correct. It's a solution. It will go on the graph. It will be on the line, maybe. Three. If you plug in three, what happens then when you plug three in there? Makes it point five. No, you're, you're doing like <coughs> so three over one. You're multiplying straight across. Yep, multiplying straight across. Mm -hmm. Three over three. Six over three. Three divided by three is one. Three. Well, if you did 3 over 3, which is 1, and you multiply 1 by 2. Or if you do 2 times 3, which is 6, divided by 3, 6 divided by 3 is 2. 2. Right? So essentially, this 3 cancels this 3, and we're left with 2 minus 1. So we plugged in a 3. That canceled out this denominator of 3, and we wound up with a 1. That's a nice point to be able to graph. It's right on. The, the crosshairs, right? So you can go over one, two, three, comma one. Is that point three has zero? I like that idea. The idea was to make this not a fraction. It's just we had to plug in a fraction to do it. But 
three halves zero, that's on there. Negative one, negative five thirds, that'll be on there too. <coughs> but three comma two, or th sorry, three comma one is a lot easier to pinpoint and be accurate when you graph it. So again, one more time, why was three a good choice? And the easiest of the ones we've seen so far. Yeah. Megan? Why was it one? Yeah, why was because three a good choice? Because it didn't come out of fraction. Because it didn't come out of fraction, because the denominator divided that three, the denominator of three divided this three, and no more denominator, right? No more fraction. Okay, so let's continue with this line of thinking. After three, if we were to keep going to the right, what would be the next number that would be easiest? Four, six, six would be the next one. Because six is the next number after three, that three is a factor of. One equals two thirds times six, one minus one. So it's three times six, Factor of two, y equals two times two, three. Four, six, six comma three, three comma one, and zero comma negative one. So it seems it's easiest in this case to step over by threes. So once you get to a multiple of three, and you plug a multiple of three in for x, then three will divide that multiple of three. Now I want you to see if you, you notice a pattern, and could you make a guess? If I went back to negative three, three, three times negative one. Okay, so go back to negative three, put a point right there at x equals negative three. Do you have a guess what the y value would be? Negative three. Why do you have negative three for the y value? Uh, Why is that your informed guess? I don't know. Like, uh, Not just because it's the same, right? No. Okay. So I'll get you to a y of negative three. By two, we move to the left three, and down two, to the left three, down two, to the left three, down two. Okay. So that, what we're noticing that pattern there is what we call the slope. Now, it's not necessarily from this point to the next point, as if that's the next point. It is the next easiest point. There's a bunch of points in between. We found one earlier. It was three halves comma zero. There's an infinite number of points between these two, but between this point and the next easiest point to find, we would just need to move up two and to the right three. And we already noticed this moving horizontally three was nice because the denominator was three, and that denominator of three will divide any multiple of three that we put in here. So we want to move in steps in the x direction in chunks of three, multiples of three. And then depending on what that multiple of three is, whether it be three, or six, or nine, or 12, or whatever, uh, we'll then get uh, you know, the leftover, six divided by three is two, and we'll multiply that by the numerator, two. So I'll just take this numerator and multiply it by whatever this divided by three is. And that'll be what we add on to negative one. Okay. Let's do one more, and I want you to, if you didn't catch all that, we're just going to do it again, see if we catch it this time around. Thank you. 
What's the first point, the easiest point to find? Zero. Putting zero in parentheses. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so we find the point zero comma. What, what would y be? Negative two. Negative two. If it's zero in parentheses, it's gone. We get negative two for the y. Negative two on the y axis. Very good. Okay. So we're just going to observe the same pattern again right now. After zero, if we were to just choose to move, we could move left, but let's move right. If we were to move to the right, we could plug in one, two, three, four, five, six, whatever we want for x. What would be the next easiest x value to plug in? Really? Four. Four. Why four? <coughs> because that four that you plug in for x will cancel with this four right here. Exactly. Because if plug in a 4 here, 4 over 1, if you like to look at it that way. 4 divides 4, 4 divided by 4 is 1. So we're just left with 7, minus 2, minus 5, so point four, five. So we move over, 1, 2, 3, 4, and move over 4. Okay. So right, we're at negative 2. Right. What are we going to add to negative 2 to get up to the y value? Negative two up seven. Move up seven. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That puts us at four comma five. <coughs> we could have plugged in one or two or three or a half or three or one and three quarters or whatever we wanted to. Any of those, though, well, first of all, those fraction ones would have fractions in them. If we plug in one, we'd get a fraction. Two would give us a fraction. Three would give us a fraction. But four, the number four, cancels with this four, and then we don't have a fraction anymore. What would be the next best after four? Eight. Eight. What about in the negative direction? What would be the first one in the negative direction? What? Negative. What about this direction? Negative four, then? Negative eight. Negative eight, then? Negative twelve. On and on it goes. <coughs> um, what if we were to go to is this five, six, seven, eight? What if we were to go? I'm just going to try and draw this a little straighter. What if we were to go to x equals eight? What would you guess the y value would be? seven more, yeah. five plus seven will give us a y of 12. You can see, you want to move over by fours. Move over by fours, that's the best. You move at four, eight, 12, 16, and so on. Okay. Every time you move over four, <coughs> you're going to add on how much more? Seven, seven more. Okay. I'll start here, and move over four, I'll add uh, seven. If I move over to eight, I'll go up 14. Why is that? Because if we go over to 8, right, we always have this negative 2 as part of the calculation. right? And then we add on whatever this is. But if we go to 8, 8 divided by 4 is 2. And so we add 14 to negative 2, which is 12 which is seven higher than five, and five was seven higher than negative two. Right. We're add, always adding on a seven. We add on another seven. We add on another seven right, to the, the previous one. Yeah. So that gives us the point three. Well, just to see if we're paying attention, we'll do it one more time. Negative four, if we went to 
what's it? X is negative 4. What do you think that Y value would be? down 7 to the left 4, down 7 to the left 4, down 7. Well, this was at negative 2. If we move down 7 from there, we'll be at negative <coughs> Okay. So you'll notice, whatever this fraction is, if I want to move from one point to the next easiest point to find, I'm going to want to move over this much over that much, okay? So that number in the bottom will always be what we call the run. That'd be the horizontal right, from one point to the next. You want to move over that much, whatever that is. Okay. And whenever you move over that much, you're going to add on that much more to the point that you're already at, okay? If I'm at this point, I want to move over the run. The run here is four. And I want to move, or sorry, now I see why if I'm confused. This would be the rise. So we want to move over 4. It's going to go from 4 to 8. And we want to move up the amount of the rise. The rise is 7. And so we go from 5 to 12. This is what we call the slope. For graphing lines here, all lines are straight. All lines are going to have a certain steepness or slope, you know, how slanted they are is uh, <coughs> what the slope measures. So let's put this all to use. Um, <coughs> for x and then get y of negative 6. Absolutely. Put a 0 there. It goes away. Get a y of negative 6. 0, 6, 0, negative 6. Okay. And this denominator says the next number that I want to plug in would be 5. Right? I'd move over to the right 5 and then do what? Up 3. Go up 3. Five, and move up one, two, three, and go. If we move over another five, ten, uh, one, two, three, four, five, we move up another three. Mm -hmm. Here we're at five, negative three. Here we're at ten, zero. We don't have to do all that. I only just need two points. So we can just do zero, negative six, go up five and over three, or sorry, up. 3 and over 5, over 5 up 3. If we were here, we could move down 3, it's the left 5. But the slope tells us how to get from a point that we know to another really easy to find point. I'd like you to also notice if we moved up, not, not 3, but if we moved up 1 and a half, right, just half as much, just choosing half as much for no reason at all. Move up one and a half. One and a half. How much would we move Two. over? Two. What's that? Two and a half. Two and a half. We move up half of three, we move over half of five. Right? The ratio is the same. Whether or not Derek meant it or if he didn't mean it, he realized that if we move up half of three, we would have to move over half of five. The ratio of rise to run will always be the same no matter what. If we move up uh, one, then you have to move over five thirds. And if you move up six, you have to move over ten. The ratio is always the same. Okay. So without really having to do anything at all, maybe some simple mental calculations to find zero, negative six, then we follow the slope up to the next point, and we have enough points to draw a line. I give you one more graph to graph on your own. Actually, is, I'm going to give you two things to do. Uh, 
Um, this is 13. It starts out like this, which is not slope intercept form. If we want to use this real slick uh, method, I think it's, it's when m point seems per, it's very simple. We find the slope in it, we find the, the y-intercept and the slope, and we are, we're done graphing the least quickly. <coughs> um, so if we wanted to use that, it needs to be a slope-intercept form. So we would need to take this, and how would we get this to be a slope-intercept form? Generally, what do we need to do? That would give us a fraction of y over x. But this doesn't have a y over x, right? Oh, that's just x. Oh, wait. Would you what? Mm -hmm. Never mind. What do all these slope intercept form equations have in common? Y. Y is by itself on one side. So that's what we need to do. You need to get y by itself on one side. So once you work on that first, if you get that, then you graph that. Getting y by itself, presenting its own troubles. Um, so these are the skills we were working on uh, in previous sections. Getting one of the variables to be by itself on one side. You can see what we want is y equals. We don't want negative three y. We want six x minus three y. We just want y. So. We systematically get rid of the things that are not y in a way that's probably like the best way to do this way. Yeah? We plug zero into x. Okay, but that's, we don't want to get just y as some number, right? That's not what these equations have. They have y is equal to something times x plus another number. Again, right? The other side <coughs> has still x in it. So that it can be a function that we can plug something in for x and then figure out what y would be. Here, so you divide by positive three. There. Divide by positive three. Because so. everything's divisible by three. Yeah. So if I want to divide this by three, what I really need to do is divide this whole side by yeah. three. Okay. So what will that give us? That'll give you two x. Okay. Minus three. Minus, minus zero. Minus zero? Or no, it's minus one. Just minus y. Yeah. And that would be uh, three. 
Negative three. Okay, that makes the number certainly a little smaller. Easier to work with. So we're going to get y by itself. Divide by 2x. We divide this by 2x. No, we subtract by 2x. Okay. Subtract 2x. Divide by 2x. We do it. But if we subtract 2x, 2x minus 2x, 2x minus 2x is 0. Mm -hmm. yeah, negative y equals, and we saw in slope in that form that the x came first, so we'll just do negative 2x minus 3. Almost there we have negative y, more positive y. I can turn, turn a negative number into a positive number. What's that? Another negative number. And we, we don't want to change it in any other way but just to make it from negative to positive. What negative number would you use? Y. Y. If we did negative y, negative y divided by negative y is a number divided by itself, that'd give us one. All we want to do is, is get a positive y. So if we did divide by negative 1, mm -hmm. so negative y divided by negative 1 is positive y. Negative 2x divided by negative 1 is 2x. Negative 3 divided by negative 1 is 3. y equals 2x plus 3. That's the slope intercept form. Sure, you could have instead of dividing by 3 on both sides first, you could have subtracted 6x on both sides, got negative 3y equals negative 6x minus 9. And then divide by negative 3. Wouldn't uh -huh. that be different? Well, let's find out. It shouldn't be. If it is, then somebody did something wrong somewhere. We divide this by negative 3. Negative 3 divided by negative 3 is 1, so 1 times y. Negative 6 divided by negative 3 would be positive 2. Negative 9 divided by negative 3. So whether we found it this way or that, easiest point to find first is the easiest point to find right now, first off, first thing. Three. Three. Zero, comma three, plug in zero for x, you find three for y. Zero comma three. So what's our slope? Two over one. Two over one, very good. Over what? That's rise over run. Mm -hmm. It means we're gonna move over two. how much? One. Move over one and up how much? Two. Up two. So this is kind of the way. <coughs> so we moved over one, so that'd be one, and up two, so that'd be three plus two is So let's say we have a line with a positive slope. A positive slope. Let's say we're here and we want to move to the right. We'll move right and then we'll move which direction? Left. Left. Positive run, positive rise. X, positive x is to the right, positive y is up. So we'll move something like that. So if that's how we move for a positive slope, then what will all lines of positive slopes have in common? What's that? The way the coordinate. Oh, 
Um, well, I guess just about every line is going to wind up in quadrant one at some level. Well, it's positive, it's like this point is going to be. What point is? Um, I, I think it's interesting. But if, if we if we have a positive slope, we're just going to move to the right and up to the right and up to the right. And up. Whether we move to the right a lot and not and up not very much. It's barely okay. I'm just going to fix that. Or we move <coughs> over not very much and up a lot. All these lines of positive slopes from the left, and you move from the left to the right, which direction do they move? You move from the left to the right, vertically we're going up. Right? So from the left to the right, we can say that it rises. If we were to be moving from the left to the right, we'd be walking up a hill. Up a really, really steep right there. But a negative slope. Negative slope means that number in front of x is a negative number, right? And it's rise over run. Right? This is a number. It's a number that represents how how much vertically we move, and a number how much represents how much horizontally we move. For this to be a negative number, how do we get this fraction to be a negative number? Cameron? Uh. If we want a fraction to be a negative number, then how do we get it to be a negative number? What has to be true about a fraction for the whole thing to come out to be negative? But if this number is negative, and this number is, if this number is negative, and this number for this whole thing to come out to be negative, this number is negative, this number is positive. Positive, negative divided by positive. But if this number is positive, one of them has to be negative. So if we start at this point and we move positive, if I'm moving to the right, which one of these is positive? Um, the run, 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 run is positive. So then we have to move which direction? Down. down to get to our next point. Or if I move down, 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 which one of those is negative? The rise. The rise, which means I have to move. Run. run has to be positive. What if we start here, and now we move up, which means the run or the which is which is positive. We're moving up. Rise, Rise is positive, so run has to be negative. negative. Okay, so one of them has to be negative. So no matter how we look at it, no matter which one of them is negative, we're always going to fall. Right? The line with a negative slope falls as we move. any number of words to describe what's going on here, but rises and falls is pretty common. Okay. Or we simply say a line with a positive slope, a line with a negative slope. Positive and negative slope. Okay. Now here's a thing we started to do a second ago. lines are parallel. Yeah, these two lines are parallel. And I can, I can take these two parallel lines and move them around. And, but no matter where I put them, whether they're like this or like this, if they're going to be parallel, well, first of all, what's it mean for two lines to be parallel? They'll never intersect. They'll never intersect. So. What do these two lines have in common? If they're, what, what's the same about these two lines that they're never going to intersect? Their slope. Their slope is going to have to be exactly the same. If, for instance, um, we were going to go down uh, 3 and move to the right, let's call it 7. Well, if we want this other line never to touch this line, 
we would have to move in the exact same pattern. Otherwise, if it were to have a bigger rise, as if it were to, to go down more quickly, then it would intersect over here. If its run was a little bigger, then it would become a little bit flatter, and then it would intersect somewhere over there. Okay. So their slopes have to be identical. Parallel lines have equal, equal slopes. They have the exact same slope, otherwise you're going to run into each other. So if I were to ask you if two lines were parallel, you would check and see if Why do you say that? Why do you say it doesn't have a slope? Because you can't really figure out where, where the slope is at. Okay, so the slope is the rise over the run. Yeah. Correct? Okay, so here's a point, and let's say here's another point that we're going to follow the slope to get to. Right? Alright, so we take the rise. How much is that rise going to be? Let's, let's say, let's say, that it's 14. We go up 14. How much are we going to go? Okay, yeah, that's the rise. Rise. How much is the run going to be? There is no run. There is no run. There's a zero run. Okay, so now we have this fraction 14 divided by zero. That's zero. 14 divided by zero. That's about a little bit. If you divide by zero, there is no definition for dividing by zero. It breaks math to divide by zero. And there's the whole of the universe. Just don't do it. You divide by zero, there's just no way to conceptualize dividing by zero. Divide by zero does not fit into our math system. If I could divide by zero, if dividing by zero was allowed by math, then I could prove <coughs> to you that one equals two. If I can prove 1 equals 2, I can prove any number of ridiculous things. So you have to calculate that there's a math error. Yeah, so it's a math error. There's, you're not going to find something that divides by 0 and then gives you some kind of answer. Try it on your own calculator, divide by 0, it'll probably give you error or E on the left, bottom left. Or if you have a graphing calculator to say, there's a problem, you divide by 0, that's not OK. Uh, even computer programming software like Java or C++ or whatever, if you divide by 0, it'll say, oh, you got to got an error here, you divided by zero. You can't do that. Okay? There's just no way to divide by zero. Um, so what we say about that slope, a slope where we have a rise over zero, we say it's an undefined slope. And while we're on the subject, what about a horizontal line? Here's a point, let's say we move over 37. Okay. So you got a run of 37. What's the rise? Yeah. Zero rise. So this slope. Is a zero slope. Zero slope. Now zero divided by 37. That has a definition. It's zero. Take nothing, divide it into 37 pieces, you still have zero. Slope is a zero, so horizontal lines, zero slope. Vertical lines, I guess we're over here, undefined slope. Fantastic question. Yeah. Can I show you No. 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 No.
Are there any other questions? No.